Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our Leaders Debate on Education. My name is Peter Rukavina. I'm President of the PEI Home and School Federation. Our organization represents local home and schools in 53 elementary, intermediate and high schools from Tignish to Surrey. We're a collaborative body of some 40,000 parents, guardians, teachers, administrators and staff who meet locally and cooperate provincially to advance the total well-being of every island child. This debate falls on the afternoon of our 62nd annual general meeting and comes at the end of a, very, uh, a day of very vigorous discussion of public education amongst our members and our partners in education. Indeed, the questions for this debate were developed collaboratively this morning by our members. And you can identify our members because we're the people in the room who have name tags on. <laughs> I'd like to welcome the leaders of the political parties running candidates in the May 4th provincial general election in alphabetical order by last name. They are Peter Bevan Baker from the Green Party, Rob Lance from the PC Party, the Honorable Wade, uh, H. Wade McLaughlin from the Liberal Party, and Mike Redman from the NDP. I'd ask you to give them a, a round of applause. <laughs> we are tight for time today, so with, ask, I, with that, I ask that you hold your applause until the very end of the debate. Time is of the essence. Uh, we've invited the leaders here today seeking their views on a variety of issues in public education. Perhaps more so than any other domain, education only works when undertaken in a collaborative, positive spirit, and we are confident that spirit will carry the debate today. Our moderator today is former PEI Home and School Federation uh, President Marion Murphy. Our timekeeper is Heather Mullen, our regional director for the Morrell Family of Schools. Our debate will proceed as follows. Each leader will have two minutes to make an opening statement. Following opening statements, the moderator will address uh, questions to the leaders. Each leader will be given one minute to respond to each question. At the conclusion of the debate, each leader will have a two-minute closing statement. Our timekeeper, Heather, will stand up or hold up a card 30 seconds before the speaking time is up for each statement in question. We'll stand up at the end of each uh, question. The speaking order for the opening statements was determined by random draw just a moment ago, and the speaking order for the uh, closing statements will be the reverse of that. The order of answering the questions will go alphabetically and will rotate uh, through the leaders, so each has an opportunity to ans uh, answer questions first. With that, I thank you all for coming. I encourage you to engage your local candidates in a lively discussion of public education, and I cede the floor to our moderator. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, and thank you all for coming to the participants and to those who have come to listen. We appreciate this time on behalf of the education of our children on PEI. This morning we talked a great deal about the importance of parent, teacher, and child. You folks, in whatever role you end up playing at the end of the election, can play a great deal in enhancing the education of our children and, and our youth and uh, even our adults. And so we're, we're pleased that you all agreed to come and to be a part of this debate. The order in which you will give your two minutes uh, uh, introduction, we will start with Peter, and then Mike, and then Wade, and then Rob. When the debate is finished, we'll go in reverse order. When it comes to answering the question questions, the first time, Peter will start, and then you'll just follow along. The second question, you, Rob will start, and you'll just follow along. The third question, Wade, and so on, and the fourth question, Mike, and so on. And in case anybody is wondering why I'm calling them by first name, I ask their permission, <coughs> what they would wish. All right, we shall begin with Peter. Your time starts now, Peter. Two minutes, introduction, opening, opening remarks. Thanks, Marion, and welcome, everybody. It's lovely to be here. One of the many lovely things about running as a candidate in an, 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 in an election is that you get to meet all sorts of interesting individuals, and interesting groups. And one thing that has struck me over the last few weeks of, as we've been campaigning hard is the depth and the breadth of wisdom that's out there in our communities. When, when you run as a candidate, it's very easy to look at the political process as a top-down process. And that's not the way it has to be. There is tremendous wisdom and tremendous genius in our communities. And that's reflected and celebrated in one of the Green Party pil pillars, which is active citizenship and self-determination. That belief that there is a greater wisdom, there is a greater good in the, in the community than there is above. And one of, the, one of the primary goals of government should be to allow that to be expressed, to allow that collective genius to be expressed. And 
I saw it no more than, than in the documents that were sent to us by the Home and School Federation, a wonderful group of people with some great ideas. And a couple of them I picked, a couple of the talking points I picked out. The first, first one, are standardized tests helpful? Are they even understandable? Hmm. Grade levels are a myth. Social education, citizenship, and soft skills can be, can be missed when we have a focus on analytics. Students not having sufficient food is a big problem because poorly nourished kids don't learn well. Keep it up. Class composition is a challenge. Not just class size, but class composition is a challenge. And how do we meet the individual needs of every student? I mean, there, there were dozens of really great ideas in there, but I, I was left thinking the Federation does not want to pick away at the edges of education. They want to actually challenge the foundations upon Thank you. Yeah, that's not a lot of time. <laughs> All right, Mike, we're ready for your two minutes. Oh well, boy, that's a tough room. Right? <laughs> so I'll be brief. <laughs> as a father of three and, and as uh, uh, of someone who comes from an education uh, background with my father and my brother, uh, it's, uh, it's a tremendous opportunity today to listen to the other leaders, also engage in dialogue. And uh, we had a wonderful opportunity in 2014 to uh, hold an education forum in Summerside, and we got the chance to listen to community members, uh, people within uh, within the education department, and really look at things like a lack of a strategic plan, the lack of collaboration among teachers, uh, an island that has not addressed its child poverty issues, and those are significant uh, physical activity. And I really believe and we in the NDP believe that to address education is to hold those things like art and music and physical activity and nutrition as a, as a huge component in allowing children the opportunity to get a, a proper education. And uh, so I'm looking forward to today and uh, looking forward to listening to the other leaders and uh, hearing some of the questions. So thank you very much. Record time, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> to the point. Wade. Thank you, Marion, and thank you for the invitation uh, to join the Home and School Federation for, and for putting on this event. Um, as you know, I've spent uh, most of my career in education at the post-secondary level, and I firmly believe that education is the foundation of our society and, and of our future. Um, the preparing for today, I took a look at the um, annual reports of the various home and school associations that were in your materials. Um, and about half of the websites of the schools throughout the province. And it's really impressive to see what is being done in the schools and in the collaboration with the home and school associations in the various schools to enable our students to do well, to put on programs that wouldn't otherwise be put on, and to constantly strive to do better. And that's really the key to all education, is to strive for excellence, to always want to do better, to emphasize uh, student learning and achievement, and to make all of our decisions and to devote all of our collaboration and resources uh, toward that end. And I think that's really the key to what we're doing uh, here today and what it's so important to acknowledge as we look at some of the points where we may feel that we're more challenged in education is to never lose sight of the work that is being done by teachers and by schools and by the Home and School Federation and associations in the various schools to offer an excellent educational system in our province. And we've had terrific achievements, uh, notably recently, in early learning. And we've been making headway through the rest of the system, and we always have to strive to do better. And that's what I look forward to being one of the main results of this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Wade. And now, Rob, you have your turn. Thank you very much, and thank you to the Home and School for hosting this today. Uh, my, uh, my family roots run deep in the Home and School uh, movement on Prince Edward Island. My grandmother, Mrs. Dorothy Lance, was involved in the, home and, uh, the School Improvement League, and she was the second president of the uh, Home and School Federation uh, from 55 to 57. And so uh, she'd be very proud of me being here today to take part in this discussion. Uh, as a, a father of two young boys, uh, I understand the challenges of, of personally staying engaged with the education of my children. We all live very busy lives. Uh, we hardly have time to think sometimes, uh, particularly this uh, past week. 
for me. And, uh, you know, and uh, as a parent, I sometimes feel guilty that I'm not involved more. And I know it's a challenge. It's not just a challenge for us as parents. It's a challenge for the home and school associations. I know that they're struggling with ways to uh, further engage um, parents in the education of their children. I know that from uh, conversations with people involved. I know that from the material that I've reviewed. But um, my wife and I are constantly struggling. And um, you know, as government, we need to uh, strive for to raise the bar in education. And uh, my grandmother understood that the importance of the school-home community relationship I fully understand it. Our challenge is how to uh, strengthen that relationship moving forward because we all have the best interests of our children in mind and the future of this province. Thank you very much. Thank you, each and every one of you. And now I will read the first question. And these questions were collated from all of the people who were here this morning. They sat at their tables and they spent 45 minutes writing questions that they wished to give to you. And um, then those were collated and made into a simple um, draft question. So uh, each, you will each answer the question. You have only one minute to answer these. But we have uh, quite a lot of questions that we want to get to. Um, and I'll let you know that all of the questions that were asked are now in the hands of the Federation. And uh, they will be coming forward to you one way or another over the next months and years. So we, uh, we need to thank all of the people who were here this morning to formulate those questions. And so we will be starting with Peter and just going down the line. Uh, the question is, do you support the election of school board trustees in the English language school board? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Should I go? I, I, <laughs> <laughs> If you'd given me that extra 59 seconds on my opening remarks, yes. it would be just fine. Uh, I, I, th I, th I think in all seriousness that one of the, one of the critical elements that's missing from our education system is more involvement of, of parents in, in, in the system. And uh, an elected school board would certainly do that. I would love to see also uh, students, oh my gosh, oh that's 30 seconds, right? Yes. I thought I was getting cut off already. <laughs> I would also love to see students elected to school boards. Um, and I think every school should have its own student, uh, its own advisory council. So yes, the, the English language school board should be elected, but I think we should go much further than that. And each family of schools should have its own elected board. Thank you. And now we will go on to Rob. I will repeat the question. Do you support the election of school board trustees in the English language <coughs> school board? Yes, <laughs> and I agree with uh, much of what Peter just said. Um, the challenge is uh, to increase the participation, and we need to align the school board elections with municipal elections or provin provincial elections, whichever works best. But there is, uh, you know, that is a constant challenge when you, uh, you're you're running any electoral process is to engage people and uh, drive the participation. Uh, so that needs to be looked at, but the, uh, the election of school boards, I think, is absolutely mandatory to uh, engage the community. Uh, I would say that um, I believe we should reserve a position on the elected school boards for the Home and School Federation to strengthen that relationship. And uh, I would go so far as to say that um, the school board itself and the Home and School Federation uh, need to have a stronger relationship and perhaps a dedicated uh, employee of the, of the board. Thank you. And now, Wade, I will repeat the question. I hear the question. Do you support yeah. the election of school board trustees in the English language school board? Your time starts now. Yes. Uh, and then I think we have to look for ways to supplement uh, those elected trustees, in particular where we have concerns about participation, which we have had in the past. So uh, one of the things that's been, uh, I think, done quite effectively in 
Alberta and New Brunswick, and that we've moved forward uh, earlier this week in the case of health, is to look for district advisory groups who can bring perspective and input and where that might indeed line up with the uh, families of schools. And I think we should also be looking for ways that we can supplement the elected trustees with others who can bring expertise, an example being students, and there may well be others who can strengthen the overall governance. And that's the point about school boards, is it's got to be about governance, not about operations. Thank you, Wade. And now, Mike, I will repeat the question. I won't repeat them all as we go along, but I just want to be fair in the first one. Do you support the election of school board trustees in the English Language School Board? And your time starts now. Yes, yes, we do. And actually, we advocated very strongly in the last couple of years to attach uh, school board elections with municipal elections, because obviously the, the voter turnout for municipal elections is lower than a provincial election, and we thought it would uh, help increase uh, the visibility and the opportunity for people to, to step up. So, absolutely. Thank you. We will go on to the second question, and this time Rob will start. And you'll just go down the line. Okay. And so the second question is this. What qualities will you look for in your key leadership positions, i.e., the Minister and Deputy Minister of Education? Rob. I'll look for... Uh the qualities of an individual who's willing to look at new ideas, fresh thinking, to look at new ways of doing things, and uh, willing to take risks. Someone who will, uh, will engage with the education community, because I know the ideas are out there. But frankly, I'm interested in someone who is not uh, married to the status quo. Um, I think that there is a lot of room for improvement in our education system, and I know the solutions to raise that bar and to improve outcomes are out there. We need to listen. We need to act. It's as simple as that. Thank you, Rob. And now, Wade. I think the real, the real key in leadership, uh, education, and uh, in education and elsewhere is the capacity to listen and to learn. Uh, and from that, to then take decisions and to work with others in a collaborative way to implement them. Uh, and a key part of that is what I call emotional intelligence, and I think that's particularly the case when it comes to uh, education. Uh, and finally, I think it's highly desirable uh, that there be uh, people in these positions who have direct knowledge and experience with the educational system. Thank you. And to you now, Mike. Well, obviously, I, I think if somebody has a teaching background is, is essential in understanding small communities and rural communities and uh, those communities that they, the education system is, is represented. Uh, comes with fresh ideas, uh, looks at ideas and best practices around the world, like the Finnish school model, but also understands that there's a need, real need for collaboration. Somebody that can see the fact that we need our health and our education justice system uh, all working together in social services, that there's real dynamics within the education system that need to be addressed, and uh, that's what somebody I would look for. Thank you. And Peter? Well, I first want to endorse all the ideas I've just heard. Um, I, I, I think we don't do enough of that, actually. Uh, we spend too much time fighting at each other's throats, and when you hear good ideas, I think it's important that we, that we acknowledge that. So uh, I didn't hear anything there that I have a problem with. I think we need courageous leaders. I think we need leaders who are daring and willing to look outside the box. Um, there are new models in education. The industrial model of education is being challenged everywhere around the world. And some very innovative things are being done, particularly in Scandinavian countries, where they recognize, I think, far more than we do here, that education is not just about educating you from the eyebrows up. It's about educating the whole child emotionally, spiritually, physically, as well as academically. And I would like somebody in those positions who is open-minded enough, courageous enough to, to recognize that and be willing to, to look at new models of education, new ways of, of, of helping children be the best they can be. Thank you. Um, this round, Wade, you will begin. And the question is this. We heard this morning about a group in Nova Scotia that includes unions, home and school, school boards, and the department that work collaboratively to develop a unified, cohesive plan for education. Would you commit to establishing the, to the establishment of a similar group on PEI? 
That was unions, home and school, school boards, and the department to work collaboratively to develop a unified, cohesive plan for education. Would you commit? That sounds to me a lot like the makeup that we might have in mind for these district advisory boards that I had in mind. I mean, you have to really think about how a group like that is going to then input into the overall governance uh, of the system. I think it's fantastic if a group like that would collaborate, and I would add to it students. Thank you. And uh, we go on to Mike. I was waiting for the question. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just joking. Sorry. <laughs> Try humor there. Yes, but I'd, I'd add to that as well. And, and you know what? I think when you want to know what's going on in our schools, we need to engage our teachers. Our teachers know what's happening. And if I want to know how our, our, our kids are doing, I'm going to ask the teachers. I have great relationships in my own business with teachers, and we really work hard to identify those kids that have, have uh, special needs, if you would, and, and challenges. So yes, it's a great idea, and collaboration is always a wonderful uh, tool, but it has to involve our teachers. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Peter? Well, this perhaps allows me to finish the statement I was hoping to make my opening <laughs> remarks, where I said, that there is a greater knowledge, there is a greater wisdom in the collective than there is when things come from above, when things are, are, are uh, brought from, from upper levels of management. And using a collaborative approach like this, where we do involve the unions and all of the other people to, to establish uh, ideas about how education will work, I think if you bring in a diversity of opinions and ideas, inevitably you will end up with a richer education system. So I think it's a wonderful idea and definitely something that the Greens would implement. Thank you, Peter. And now, Rob, do you want the question? No, okay. it's all right. Uh, but it's hard to say anything novel when you go last, so. <laughs> <coughs> um, but I think uh, working collaboratively should be a given um, when you have a group of stakeholders. Uh, it shouldn't be forced upon them. It should be uh, something that happens naturally. But, uh, you know, there was, there was a suggestion that um, we need to supplement our elected boards. Um, and I, I think that there's trust issues in government in uh, allowing elected boards to run education in this province. And I, I think that um, I wonder if those if that's intended to uh, provide direction or guidance. Uh, so uh, we need trust. We need collaboration uh, in running our health our education system. Thank you. The next question is for Mike to begin with. So you'll have no trouble remembering this one, <laughs> will you? Say, and it's shorter too. The current commitment is to outfit all island schools with Wi-Fi in four to five years. Is this soon enough? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I don't have Wi-Fi where I live, and it doesn't work very well. So the, the promise to have a Wi-Fi across the island by the previous Liberal government has not worked. Uh, you know, it's very, very important that we give our teachers and our classrooms and our, uh, our educa education system the best possible advantages, and the internet is obviously a very, very useful tool. So it's something that we need to change. And we actually have wonderful, wonderful small uh, internet companies across PEI that could do the job, so we need to reach out, work with those, uh, work with those businesses, and uh, let's get the job done. So it has to happen sooner. Peter? Improved, uh, improved access to the internet is critical not only for schools but for all of rural development on Prince Edward Island. And right in our platform, we talk about enhancing high-speed internet to make sure that every community on Prince Edward Island has that. So many businesses these days are not location dependent anymore. Um, there are lots of things can be done. And in the schools specifically, one of the arguments made for closing down all of the small schools, which is a process that's been going on on PEI for 40 years or more, is that it was difficult for those schools to get the information, the knowledge, the resources that they required. With the internet now available everywhere, access to that sort of stuff is universal. And one of the main arguments for closing down the small schools has disappeared. And I actually envision a reversal of that process of putting more schools back in our rural communities to revitalize them and bring back repopulation to rural PEI, which is a critical part of our, our development, I believe, as, as we go forward. 
Okay. Thank you, Peter. Rob? Well, I would agree with Peter, and I've, um, I've announced a moratorium on school closures because I strongly believe that they are a vital part of any small community, and uh, losing them is fatal to our rural communities. Um, if it's not already gone out, there will be shortly after this uh, debate a press release from my party stating our position on Wi-Fi in schools. It's a project we'll get to in the first year of my new government. I'm committed to that. I come from the technology sector. I understand the importance. And I want to congratulate Peter Rukavina from the Home and School Federation for his pilot project at Prince Street School where he demonstrated through his own hard work uh, the, uh, the possibilities and the, uh, the utility of Wi-Fi in our schools. He's been a champion of this, and I want to congratulate him for moving it forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob and Wade. Marion, there was a commitment made in the capital budget last fall to move forward with Wi-Fi in schools, and precisely to answer your question, I would commit to speeding up that process and to having Wi-Fi in all of our schools within 18 months, that's to say by the end of calendar 2016, and providing the funds in our capital budget for that to be so. Thank you. Okay, we're on to question five, and this time Rob will start answering. The question is, how do you propose to address the current inequities across the province with respect to French education? I, uh, I did 12 years of French immersion. Um, my, uh, my son is in grade seven. He's starting in late immersion. And uh, I know that there are challenges um, educating our children in both official languages. I, I had a meeting in Summerside recently about this very issue. It relates to the issues that we have with class composition and uh, opportunity. It relates to our issues with income security. And I think we have to have a hard look uh, in New Brunswick, uh, one of two, only two bilingual provinces in this country. They've had a hard look at how they educate in both official languages. And I think we have lessons to learn from them. I have some feelings, mixed feelings about my education uh, in French immersion. I think it has advantages for me and disadvantages. It's something I need to explore further. Thank you, and I see I made a mistake. I was supposed to ask Peter to start that. Are you okay to go now, Peter? Yeah, sure. Don't hold it against me forever. No. <laughs> Next time you're in my dental chair, Marion. <laughs> um, I grew up in Scotland where, uh, where bilingualism is not, not a big deal. Um, however, my children were all born in Canada and, and speak much better French than I do. I have a very rudimentary uh, grasp on French. Um, I'm really glad they do. Um, as far as the inequities are concerned, I'm not sure if you were talking about funding or access or I wasn't it's quite just, sure. It, it just says current inequities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm afraid I'm not, t I'm, I'm probably not well versed enough to, to answer that question, except that I absolutely value the opportunity for our children here to have an, to be able to learn French in the schools, something I wish I had had and I think we need to hang on to. Thank you. Wade? It is sort of a loaded question, uh, current inequities, to know just where that's, uh, what that's getting at. But let me say, uh, the French and English uh, learning and educational arrangements we have derived from our Constitution, and uh, those terms of the Constitution were put in place to respond to a couple of centuries of inequities. So I think we all have to recognize that, and frankly, any time we have diversity, to find every way possible to make the most out of it and not to see it as a problem or an inequity. And I might say I was interested to read the notes of the Prince Street Home and School Association and see that those meetings are translated into Nepalese. Thank you. And uh, Mike? Well, I think when you're going to talk about inequities, you, you talk about across the board. So is an education in Georgetown the same as an education at West Kent? I'm not sure it is. And so are kids exposed to the same opportunities in music, in French? in art, in, in dance. 
And I think that our kids, we need a, a real a strong look at what we're doing in terms of education. And we need to take a holistic approach to education. And that's the whole child. And Peter mentioned it before. And uh, it's, it's something that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Number six. This morning, the Home and School Federation passed a resolution calling for the establishment of a province-wide school lunch program. Will you commit to working with home and school to move this issue forward? You may go. Uh, Who's first? Yeah. Well, now, <laughs> it's, it's arguable, but you got a chance to go first, Rob. Maybe I'll let Peter go, and then we'll get back on track. Is that sure. okay? Absolutely. Okay. Um, my counterpart in New Brunswick, the leader of the Green Party there, David Kuhn, who was elected in the most recent provincial election, the first bill that he brought to the, the legislature in New Brunswick was a local food security act. Part of that involves institutional buying in schools so that schools could have access to locally produced healthy food. That is absolutely the first bill that I will bring to the House of the Legislature if I am elected on May the 4th. Providing healthy food for every single island child is a critical part of their education. I said in my opening remarks that un, uh, undernourished children just do not learn as well as others. So providing a nutritional lunch and part, as part of the, that local food security act would be the first thing that I would do as a Green Party member. Thank you. And uh, Rob? Well, I think we should certainly uh, look at expanding on the food offerings in our schools now and uh, moving towards uh, a formal uh, lunch program in schools. Uh, but I would echo what Peter says. I have a, a big interest in, in dietary issues. Uh, I've solved some of my own health problems through uh, dietary changes. And uh, I think that our Canada's food guide is, uh, has got everything just about backwards. Uh, the issues we have with obesity are caused by, uh, primarily by our high car carbohydrate sugar diet. And it's difficult uh, to get kids to eat well in school if they ha don't have a foundation of eating well at home. So those are all challenges in creating a program like this. And of course, it's, it's vital to learning. So absolutely, uh, we need to move in that direction. Thank you, Rob. Wade? Yes, Marion, I'd be prepared to commit to collaborate on this. And I think going on when one responds to this, you always have to remember, like, we're the leaders of a political party. There's a school board, there are teachers, there are home and school associations that already have breakfast and lunch programs. So I think government has to find its place that it doesn't interfere with or take apart, take away from those existing efforts, but to build on them. And government's part might be best to buy local produce and find a way to make that available to supplement and to make stronger the existing meal programs, both breakfast and lunch, which I think are very admirable and have come about through the efforts of volunteers and schools and teachers volunteering their time. So we, want, we don't want to take away from that. Thank you. And Mike? Well, what I will say to, to start is uh, it's great to have the breakfast and lunch programs that we have that exist today, but they're a charitable model. And we need to look at a government holding its responsibility. We have 5,000 children in this province living in poverty. That's a shameful statistic. And that has a dramatic effect on a child's ability to get an education. And you know, if, if there's an economic impact as well, we've advocated a universal breakfast and lunch program. It will create jobs. It will feed our kids. It will give them more. It will allow them to go to college, get employed. Attendance goes up. There's so many wonderful statistics for when you invest a dollar and what you'll get in return in terms of health consequences. And no longer can we, and, and wages bring up the buy local program. And what I will say is, we better pay attention to the CETA agreement when we talk about buy local, because it, it, signing off on CETA will take that away from us. Thank you. Uh, this time, you've both had a first. So now, Wade, you will be first this You're time. You're about that, Marion, as if it's an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're such a good teacher. <laughs> All I can say is I try. <laughs> um, and I'd like to say at this point, I make mistakes too, but they're learning, <laughs> they're learning experiences as well. <laughs> All right, so Wade. The School Act establishes free school privileges for all students. 
Yet, there are an increasing number of student fees, sports fees, and obligations to fundraise. What will you do to return PEI to being a leader in the provision of free, equitable education? I think that's, a, I have to say, a, a, a tough question to say, I'm going to return to free, equitable e education if it means that this is all going to be wiped out, because a lot of what we've been able to put in place has been made possible through those fees and through the contributions and the volunteer efforts, notably of the Home and School Associations. You just have to read through those annual reports. So for me to sit here as someone who may be a premier after the 4th of May and say I'm going to get rid of all of that doesn't seem like a particularly smart thing to say. I think uh, the, the education system has to keep doing the best we can with all of the efforts and resources that we can possibly put toward the better education and the growth and development of our students. Thank you, Wade and Mike. Well, when you look at fees, and we've seen how they increase, and, and having children of my own, every time you turn around, you're paying for something new. Uh, and really, that creates an inequality of opportunity, because not all families have that disposable income. So government has to look at ways to make sure that everybody has a quality education and how we're going to fundamentally get there. And one of the ways we could do that is by getting rid of some of the guys like us up here. We have too many politicians in BEI, too many MPs, and too many senators, for sure. Although one, one, I'm not sure where he lives, but anyways. <laughs> beyond, beyond that, we need to make sure that we give kids every opportunity, and the, and the economics around that has to, has to cease. Thank you, Mike. And Peter? Well, it's really a question about priorities, isn't it? It's, it's what government believes are the most important things that it should provide. And surely, at or near the top of the list of any government's priorities should be the education of the children for all kinds of reasons. Governments everywhere waste money. We are particularly good at it here on Prince Edward Island. And there are so many ways that we could run a more efficient government here which would free up funds to make those priorities that any government would choose that was in power actually become a reality. Too many of our critical institutions are dependent on volunteer work and fundraising, uh, not just in the schools. I have too many friends who would be starving on the streets if there were not food banks here. Government needs to set priorities and take care of the most vulnerable, and a lot of the time, those are our children. Thank you, and Rob? Well, my concern is that uh, these things that are funded through fundraising and volunteerism, uh, you know, they exclude uh, students and their families based on income and ability to participate, and that uh, it's shameful. Um, the, uh, you know, it, we place, we're placing this burden on families, and often that burden falls on teachers when they've got enough to worry about uh, just providing quality education to our students. So is it a question of underfunding? And if it is, as Peter has suggested, we need to get our priorities straight. Thank you. Okay, question number eight. Uh, Mike will start this one. Mike. Um, there are many important services that are offered outside the classroom by professionals. Psychologists, occupational therapists, speech pathologists. These services have long waiting lists. How will you address this? Well, we, we've often said that the, you know, one of the things we would do immediately is, is remove one of the, uh, the provincial uh, assessment in terms of testing and provide more of those resources. We need smaller class sizes and we need uh, those waiting lists to, to end and uh, as a family of, and that knows how that, how, uh, how that works, it's very, very difficult to have a year or two year waiting assessments with a psychologist to address issues around your child's learning. So we need to get to that right away and we need to, we need to hire and make sure that our classrooms and our schools have the resources they need to, to be functional. Perhaps an area in the education system that is more critically underfunded than any other is, is psychological services. And uh, it's not just two years, sometimes it can be three, four, or five years before a child has access to a child psychologist. That is just unacceptable. Um, there is so much distress amongst our youth these days, and a lot of that gets its beginning at a very young age. 
if that were intercepted, if we had enough psychologists, psychotherapists, just resources in the school, they don't even have to be uh, certifiably trained psychologists, just more teachers who can just be a friend to the kids when they need what they need, um, then it will, do a, a, it will get rid of all kinds of problems that come down the pipe later, health problems, uh, law and order problems, all sorts of stuff. Thank you, Peter. Rob? It takes years to train a, a, a psychologist, ch child psychologist, and uh, so there's no easy fix, not in the short term. So we need to be creative. We know that uh, our existing psychologists are overloaded, overburdened. Um, I think we need to, uh, in the short term, look to resources outside the school system, uh, within the private sector, within our health system, in order to supplement what we have now, and we need to, uh, again, this is about priorities, and uh, people are falling through the cracks, our children, and so we need to come up with a long-term plan and, um, and, uh, and move forward with that in mind. Thank you, Rob. Wait. On uh, Tuesday of this week, as part of our health uh, program, we announced and committed to additional resources for preschool testing, for autism, uh, for physiotherapy, for audiology, and for speech-language pathology. So we recognize that there is a, a need, and we realize that that is uh, an issue for families, and in particular for students, and the earlier that that is addressed, uh, the better. Thank you. We move on now to number nine. And number nine, we'll begin with just Peter. No? No. So. I'm mixed up again, Alex. <laughs> uh, you're right. Yes, I am right. Okay. All right. Keep me straight. Uh, the question is What is your position on the role of standardized testing in the education system? The role of standardized testing. I think it p plays far too prominent a role in our system. I think it causes teachers to teach to the tests. I think it ignores the needs of many children. I think it causes all sorts of problems. And I think it has become popular um, in certain education circles, but it's been discredited in many others. And again, if we look at the, Can the Scandinavian education system they've almost done away with standardized testing they don't even teach to they don't even teach subjects now they teach to topics which embrace all sorts of different subjects together in one and in doing so a child learns the connections between math and english and memory skills and social skills and all of those things so i think we place far too great an emphasis on on a small spectrum of of learning and it's not what we need to do Thank you, Peter. Rob? I s suspect that you're not going to find too much disagreement on this topic, but um, I believe that there is some utility, particularly in those international tests where we can compare apples to apples. From what I'm hearing uh, from the community, from the teaching community even, is that uh, in particular our provincial common assessments, that it's just taking too much time and, and resources for the teachers that the results are not used in any meaningful way. And uh, it, this is just about allowing our teachers to do what they do best, uh, which is to focus on the students and uh, deliver a quality education. All right. Uh, thank you, Rob Boyd. Uh, again, I, I think you have to be, and I'm very conscious of sitting here as Premier saying, oh, this is what I would do. I mean, we have a school system with a school board and with teachers and with a department and with parents and home and school. And if we talked earlier about a collaborative approach, well, that question is one that's better considered in a collaborative way by the people who are directly concerned and actively delivering uh, the system and starting with the teachers. So of course the tests have to be used to learn from them and improve what this will be available and what the students will do in terms of their outcomes. Uh, and I think we always have to be, we always have to be trying to, to get better. And I don't think how we can get better without finding out and knowing how our students are doing. Thank you. Uh, Wade and Mike? 
Uh, thank you very much. Well, I, I've had the opportunity to, to collaborate and listen to a lot of teachers and educators across the province over the last three years. And, and to a person, uh, there's huge amounts of pressure being put on for testing, not only on the teachers, but also on our students. So I'll take the leadership role and say we would scrap the provincial assessment straight away. And the best place to assess our students is in the classroom by a teacher. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to number 10, and Rob will uh, start this round. Our classrooms are larger and more complex than they have ever been. The school board tells us there's no gas left in the tank for staffing and teaching positions continue to be cut. Will you commit to returning our schools to adequate staffing to ensure well-resourced, inclusive classrooms? Would you like me to repeat that? Why don't I? Just for everybody. Just for everybody. Our classrooms are larger and more complex than they have ever been. The school board tells us there's no gas left in the tank for staffing and teaching positions continue to be cut. Will you commit to returning our schools to adequate staffing to ensure well-resourced, inclusive classrooms? Yes, I will. I will commit to that, and it's unfortunate that over the past three years we've eliminated uh, over 100 teaching positions. It's also unfortunate that in 2009 the Gar Andrew report that recommended against doing that was shelved, hidden, and only came to light through an access to information request. I've spoken to teachers who are absolutely exasperated by the size of their classes, who have told me they're doing a disservice to their children because they cannot focus on those uh, who need their attention. And so it's, it's just fundamentally a system that's broken where teachers cannot deliver the quality education that they deserve to and that our children deserve. Thank you. And Wade? The, the question of class size and composition is really at the heart of school administration. And we have a lot of diversity and a lot of variation across the province in terms of the number and the composition of uh, classes. Um, overall, the number of educators per student has been rising because we, and our students' population has declined from about 25,000 to 20,000 in the space of uh, 12 or 13 years. So I think we have to be always cognizant of the fact that we have and still continue to face declining enrollments and we have to make the best use we have of the resources and of the teaching resources uh, that we have. So my commitment would be to put all of the resources that we possibly can toward frontline services. Thank you, and Mike? Well, we've, we've simply, and, and Rob put it uh, correctly, that we're cutting those teachers, we had an opportunity to address class composition. Uh, we've cut EAs, and uh, anybody that's in any kind of educational field realizes the challenges in the classroom are great, and uh, we simply need to get back to a formula that allows our children to learn. I, in just last week, I was in a, a classroom uh, talking with students, and there was 31, 32 students in the class. There was absolutely no way that the teacher can adequately uh, uh, teach those children. So it's something that needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed today. Thank you, and Peter? I was speaking to somebody in the hall just before we came in for this debate and, and they said you, you have a minute to answer your questions and there's just no way, this is such a complicated, incredibly convoluted question to, to imagine that we can deal with the, the complexity of a classroom, not just the size of the students, but the diversity of range and of needs and, and, and of skills of those students. And for me to answer how we would do that in a minute is impossible, except to say that I think we have to move back to a system where we don't have 25 or 30 kids all of the same age in the same class being, being fed information by a teacher. In the small schools that we used to have, the grade eight kids would teach the grade one kids. Can you imagine the, the, the relationships that would develop, the skills that would develop, the empathy that would be developed in that? We've lost all that. So it's a huge question. I, I, I just can't answer it in one minute except to say we need to do some big changes. Thank you. I might say that the reason we gave you two minutes and one minutes is because we realize you're very busy people. 
and we did not want to tie you up. And some of your answers are pretty short. You don't need any more than that time, you know. These are all questions for the future, not just for today, okay? And they're things for you to be thinking about and so on. All right, uh, question number 11, and this is the final question that has been given to me. Um, and uh, then we, we will have... Okay, they've got another message here for me. Um, Wade will begin this. And our schools range in size from 60 students to more than 1,000. Do your plans include possible school closures in the future? Let me say, we, we started out by speaking about school boards and the responsibility and authority that they would have. When those school boards in, are in place, then they have uh, authority that you know, what a premier says here today shouldn't have, be tying their hands. In a second part, we've just talked about class sizes and composition, which is very much tied up in the point that's being made about the numbers of students in schools and the diversity and range of students in schools, not just between urban and rural, but within certain of their larger uh, built up areas. So uh, I'm not going to say that my plans are to close schools. My plans would be to have a school system that is based on evidence, that is based on collaboration, that is based on effective governance systems. Thank you, and Mike? That's a great question. And, uh, you know, we need a long-term vision in Prince Edward Island. Our major industries, tourism, agriculture, and fisheries all exist in rural areas. And so we need a rural approach to schools as well. And uh, we had an opportunity to populate our rural communities with the provincial nominee program, and we did not. We used that money in inefficient ways, and people filled their pockets, as opposed to looking at rural communities and putting people in those communities for workforces, for also for education and building families. So I will tell you today, and it will be a commitment from the NDP, we would look to revitalize in our communities, rebuild in our rural communities, and that's a big part of uh, Prince Edward Island. Thank you. And Peter. Here, here, Mike. Um, we talk often of the quality of life that we have here on Prince Edward Island, and indeed it is a special place. Um, but if we want to promise that quality of life that we all want and believe we have here, we have to develop quality of place. And there are too many rural communities which have withered over the last 20, 30, 40 years. And they've withered because things like schools, doctors, churches, um, stores in the community have disappeared. Those sorts of vital services that keep a community together, the glue that holds a community together has gone. Would we close further? Rural schools, absolutely not. I mentioned earlier, I think we actually have to reverse the tide. And obviously that's not something that can be done quickly or easily. But repopulating rural communities will bring back young families. It will bring back a need for small schools in our rural communities. And almost naturally that process will be reversed. Thank you. And Rob? Well, here I wish I had more than a minute, but I have announced a moratorium on school closures and that will stay in place at least until we have elected school boards and then I would hope that they would uh, decide to keep our schools open. But people have been sounding the alarm bells on this issue for 40 years and I do agree that it, uh, you close the schools and the people follow. It, it, it's the death knell to our rural communities. We need to do everything possible to keep them open to, uh, you know, to keep these rural communities vital. The demographic, demographic tide comes and goes. It comes in, it goes out. The school that my children went to was almost closed 15 years ago, but the neighborhood has turned over, the enrollment has risen. We need to give communities the chance for that to happen in their own communities, rather than pull the rug out when they're at the bottom of their demographic cycle. Thank you, Rob. Now, that ends the formal questions that were passed to me. We are not opening the floor to the public. This is not what our intention is. You were very quick to respond, or else I was very quick to ask the questions, and so we still have some time. And so um, we're going to make an executive decision right here that instead of two minutes to close, we'll give you four. <laughs> Would you like four? Would you like five? All right, and that will give you an opportunity to some of the ones who had more things they wanted to say to say what you wanted to say. But once again, the mic will be cut off at the end of that time. Do you all agree to that, by the way? 
Is that okay? You're the boss. All right, you're okay. So you got lots of time now to sum up, but you didn't get a chance to sum up either in the beginning or as we went along. And now we go in the reverse order and I have it right here. So me saying that gave you, Rob, a chance to get your breath again. And away you go, Rob, you're first. Well, I don't think I'll have, uh, I'll require four or five minutes, but um, let me just say again, thank you for having us here today. It has been a, a challenge to prepare for any of the debates. We're running flat out and we're out there listening to people. Rather than speaking to you uh, as we are in this format here, I am st still very much in the listening phase and learning about your challenges, your issues in many areas of Prince Edward Island. And uh, it, it's very enjoyable uh, and uh, it, it gives me hope for the future. As far as education goes, I, my kids are entering their formative years. I'm fortunate that they are doing very well in their education. In fact, when I meet with their teachers, I'm often asking them to challenge them more uh, because I felt as a good student uh, throughout my uh, early learning, I felt that I wasn't challenged and I feel that that was a disadvantage. I feel that it was a disservice in some ways to me, I breezed through school. And there wasn't the opportunity for those challenges. And um, I, I feel in some ways it held me back. Just as in some ways I know there were advantages and disadvantages to my French immersion education. Uh, my, my youngest son plays chess. And um, it's been such a, a wonderful opportunity, learning opportunity for him. And I understand in Quebec that they've integrated it right into their curriculum, into, the, into their schools. And you know, it's such a, an opportunity for him to learn logic skills and spatial development and decision making and strategy. You know, we need to look at devices like that for teaching our children the skills that they, the critical skills that they need in life. Our school system needs to develop resilient individuals, uh, self-reliant individuals. We all know about helicopter parenting and we're all guilty of it, but we need to move away from that and challenge our kids to be more independent in school. I don't help my kids with their homework unless they absolutely need it. And I let them fail if they do, if, you know, if, it's, if necessary. Sometimes they need to make mistakes. And so these are just, you know, some of my own personal thoughts about the subject of education. That's really all I've got to say at this point. I look forward to learning more and more and more about the challenges in education in Prince Edward Island. And then working with you uh, as uh, the next leader of your government to raise the bar in education. Thank you, Rob. And Wade? Marion, a lot of the questions that have been raised today come one way or another to resources. And uh, it, it always feels like we're under strain or we're making choices, and that's the nature of resources. Money and time are always scarce. And currently in Prince Edward Island, we devote more than 20% of our provincial spending to the K-12 system. If you combine that with the resources that are uh, devoted to the, through the health system to what in effect is education through the post-secondary system and indeed through increasingly social services that is tied in in many ways with, with education. It's a very big part of who we are and what we care about as a province, uh, nudging up against 80% of our total spending when you put health, education, social services and those related pieces uh, together. So really uh, in a province that is highly taxed relative to others, in a province that uh, has gone a long time without balancing its books, uh, I think we always have to be coming at these questions in a collaborative fashion and in a way that recognizes that we're constantly making choices about putting the best and most important resources toward our students and through their success. And I think that's ultimately what a, a school system and an educational system in its totality, including the home and school and the parents and the ways in which people interact in our communities. I, I think one way of knowing whether we're doing well enough as an educational system, or for that matter, as a province, 
won't be whether we have this number of standardized tests or it's in this year or that year. It'll be whether your grandmother asks you what you learned today. And that, in fact, is, a, is an ultimate way of knowing that as a culture, we are really dedicated uh, to learning and focused uh, on, on our students. Uh, further, I think we've got to be constantly working in a way that puts more capacity and time and resources in the hands of those on the front lines. I spoke to someone recently who was for many years involved in teaching, then as a principal and then in school administration. And he said, you know, when I got to the end of all of that and we'd been through many uh, reforms and different theories and ways of considering things, and he said, I realized that it's really to let the teachers teach. And I believe that's important and it's certainly reflected in my own experience, the first eight years of which Peter were in one of those rural schools that you uh, refer to and I got a good education there. So I'll agree with you on that. Whether we can go back is, uh, will be an interesting question. Uh, there's a good chance that we'll have uh, some communities of Mennonites uh, moving to Prince Edward Island uh, shortly who may in fact give us a chance to see what, uh, what a one-room school can do. And I want to pick up on something else that Peter said. Uh, uh, much, of the, much of what we've talked about here today uh, feels like we're trying to work around the edges or to come at things in a way that uh, does indeed struggle with what is a very big and mm, structurally organized status quo. And we should find a way as a province to uh, really engage each other in what could be, um, let me say, a radical way to ask how we could do better in our total education system. And that ultimate test of that would be how our students can do better and learn more and be happy and be growing and developing as citizens. And if we do that, I think we'll find that meetings like this will be happy and growing and developing experiences for all of us. Now let me say, I think this has been a very important day to day and the questions that have come forward, the amount of time that was put into developing those questions and the effort and the effort at the level of schools and communities and home and school associations that brought us here today is very, very important to the success of our students and to our province and to our educational system. So thank you and thank you for the invitation to be here. Thank you, Wade. And Mike? Uh, again, I'll, I'll uh, re readdress to it. It is. It has been a wonderful opportunity to to uh, to speak with you all today and listen to the questions and the concerns. And uh, one of the things that I think we really need to address, and it's it's a it's a point a teacher made to me very recently that she went through to get her education at the University of Ottawa, and she was so keen to teach, and then she got into the classroom and she can't even, can't even take her kids on a field trip, right? We, we live on an island. We have so much of opportunity here. We have streams, hiking trails, farms. There's so much learning to be done. It's not in a classroom all the time. And kids learn differently. And as a coach for so many years, I understand that a lot of kids are practical learners too. So we need to be able to help those kids that learn in different ways, achieve the success that they want to. And I'm reminded too that when you look back, there's not just one Gary Andrews reports collecting dust. There's more than one. And uh, we don't have a strategic plan, not since 1999, 2004. And one of the, uh, the lines that sticks out to me is uh, uh, in the Department of Education Early Child Development, its vision is expressed in one sentence, that all children and students achieve to their full potential. This isn't uh, a vision for the future, this is lip service. Right? It's reflective of a government that lacks the knowledge and imagination to plan for our children's future. This government's strategy for education isn't vi visionary, it's very much reactive and it's lurching from one crisis to the next. So we need a holistic approach to education. We also have to take responsibility as a government for the social determinants of health. We have an immense poverty issue in PEI, and people don't want to talk about it. We have huge food insecurity. Our kids are not eating a healthy diet. And even those kids that are affluent, they're not eating the right foods. I see it every single day. 
We're running 100 miles an hour to get to A to B, and our kids aren't having a, the proper diet to succeed. And that has a dramatic effect on their education and their opportunity. So I understand the str struggles that people are living with. We have to address livable wages, the basic income guarantee. We haven't talked a whole lot today about mental health and addictions. It's rampant in our communities, and we've closed. One government closed all the addiction beds, and the other one is starting to now address some of these, those issues. We have a crisis in, in, in our communities where one of our parents is out west working. So there's a lot of single parents, or both parents are out west working. So grandparents are looking after children. And I hear that just about every second day. We don't have a proper public uh, uh, transportation system, and that has to be addressed. So whether we're talking about fisheries, agriculture, or tourism, that's not been addressed by the provincial government. And I reiterate what I said in the tourism debate, $186,000 does not address public transportation. It has to be uh, something that's a considerable effort by the provincial government. And we didn't get into it a lot today, but there's an, an immense issue of, of bullying in our schools. And our children are, are really struggling. And I have personal uh, experiences with that. And I feel very, very bad for school counselors because they're overworked and the caseload is, is growing by the day. So we need a government that's not scared to say our priority is and always will be our children. And that's an NDP government. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And Peter? You might be forgiven for thinking that the four people in front of you are all running for the same party. <laughs> Quite extraordinary, actually, the collegial feeling up here and, and, the, uh, and the fact that the ideas were pretty well universally expressed in different ways. However, I, I, I think there are some significant differences and I, I hope in my little summation here I'm able to to explain to you what is fundamentally different about the Green Party approach, not just to education, but to governance in general. In our schools, we teach subjects in hermetically sealed silos. You go and you sit and you do math for 50 minutes, you leave, you go and do geography, you, you don't, you get the picture. And I mentioned in my opening remarks that in some countries, that idea of teaching to subject has been completely abandoned and they now teach to topic. Let's imagine, for example, in Englewood School, where my kids went, we have a class on going to the restaurant, where you are, in doing so, developing communication skills, you're developing written skills, you're developing math skills, you could develop language skills, it could be a French restaurant, you could be developing cooking skills because you could actually serve a meal. All of these things, would develop a wide variety of skills in kids. They would have fun doing it, and they would be learning without even recognizing it. When it comes to governance, if we want to have the best education system, we have to recognize that that's connected to everything else. We can't have the best education system if we have bad health. We can't have the best education system if we have chronic poverty. We can't have the best education system if we have poor governance and fiscal management. All of these things must work together. The Green Party approach to governance is an integrated one, where all of these subjects, all of these factors that influence each other and are connected to each other are balanced, are looked at in the long term. And that is very different from what you will find in any, actually you won't find another platform yet. <laughs> you, you, the fellers sitting beside me here have planks of their platform, but none of them has released their entire document yet. The Green Party did that almost three weeks ago, and I encourage you to go and look at it. It's a document in which this idea of producing a better education system is, is based on producing better rural communities, a healthier environment, clean air, good water, healthy soil. It's based on a better healthcare system where we take care of health as much as we take care of illness, being proactive, being preventative. It's, it's about eliminating poverty in our community so kids are given an opportunity. All of these things have to work together to bring a better education system. So, I invite you to read that, and I think a lot of you out there may discover that you're more green than you think. Thank you, and thank you all. Um, 
I've always been a person who liked to start on time and end before time. And I'm sure the people who are here from the western part of the province and the eastern part will be glad to get home a little bit earlier than they thought or have a minute to go and shop in Charlottetown. <laughs> it's important that you know that there are representatives here from the west and from the east and from the central part of the province. And that's why it's so important for you to hear what they thought. Um, I heard a couple of speakers talking about teaching moments and that was what I did when I was a teacher. And I think it's one reason why I succeeded as well as I did, because I grabbed every teaching moment. When a child is ready to learn, teach him what he wants to know, answer his question. Um, I appreciate hearing that from you folks, that you're interested in that. Um, you know, you've got a busy time ahead of you. I wish you well. There'll only be one premier at the end of the day, but you'll all still be there to helpfully to support one another. I think that that's what my biggest wish for you would be, whoever's there, that you would continue to feed in ideas. Home and school will continue to feed you ideas. I can assure you of that. And we've done it for many years. And as uh, was remarked this morning, many of the things that are happening in government now are happening because of home and school resolutions from former years. And uh, so we appreciate having that opportunity to meet you all face to face. It's really a privilege for us. We have a little lunch bag for you to take with you in case you don't have time to eat for supper. And Peter, did you want to say a word? I thank you on behalf of everybody here and let us join. I will, uh, I will echo uh, Marion's thanks to each of the leaders. Thank you for giving of your time. Uh, all of your party representatives said yes as soon as we asked uh, three or four weeks ago. Uh, we didn't know at that time there would be an election. Who knew? Um, <laughs> this morning when we were developing our questions collaboratively, we're right on top of the swimming pool here, and there were children playing in the swimming pool, and I think that was a good uh, sound effect to keep in our mind. And I, I, I've been hearing the sound of the baby over here on the, the right-hand side and, and just thinking everything that you folks are talking about is basically involved in making their education. So I ask you to keep that child in your mind as you're, as you're out on the trail. And I ask all of you to actively engage the candidates across the island in, in a discussion about education over the campaign. So thank you all for coming. Thanks to the leaders. Good night.